like Take Out and Tangerine as a uh, film student. They uh, mean a lot to me to show different ways of making movies. And also, thank you for your letterbox for showing me the idiots in uh, Lars von Trier. <laughs> oh, nice. Yeah. So uh, I guess my question is, especially with uh, non-actors, uh, how do you manage realistic film dialogue? Like, how much of it is your script and how much of it is improv and all that? Right. Um, well, thank you for your kind words. I, uh, I, it comes down to the individual. It really is down to each individual. Uh, they all, every, if you're dealing with a first-timer or a non-professional, there's, there's all different levels of comfort and, and uh, intimidation. Um, sometimes you'll find a natural who is just incredible and they can improvise as well. And that's the best of both worlds. When you find a first timer who suddenly has the gift of comedic improvisation, it's like a you know, gift from heaven. Uh, but, um, you know, it's also about, if you're, if you're working with, um, and I differentiate between non-professionals and first-timers because non-professionals are people that I just like grab on the street and it will be a one, this would be the one day they're acting. They don't have any aspirations to act. It's just like, hey, be in the scene. Play a ver version of yourself or play one of your friends. Let's go, do it now. Uh, <laughs> that's the way I direct. <laughs> no, but, then, uh, but then the other, the first-timers, um, the reason I like to use that term is because um, when I use the word non-professionals in the industry, the industry takes that as unprofessional, right? And these people don't end up getting other work. And, and, it, and, it, and it's haunted me, and it's haunted some of my cast throughout the years. You know, um, Maya Taylor from Tangerine, I mean, she's been nominated, she won a Spirit Award, she's, she's proven herself. But have you seen her? No, she's, she's had one or two roles, she's still, she's fighting, She's, uh, she, she, was, she did a play recently. I mean, she's really fighting for it, but the industry is not accepting. That might also be to do with, you know, uh, the way that there's a lack of diversity in, in casting, and people aren't thinking about the trans actors out there. It's very complicated. But my, the film I made earlier on, Prince of Broadway, you know, Prince Edu is a wonderful, wonderful actor. He, she, Karin Karagulian, who was the owner of the hotel in this movie. He's been in all of my films. Armenian American actor who kicks butt. He was one of the leads in Tangerine, one of the leads in Prince of Broadway. Why has he only been in my films? I push him to agents all the time, and all they say is, oh, is he okay with playing a terrorist? I'm like, maybe, just fucking, I'm sorry. <laughs> just sign him. Like, he's ready for work. So, I don't know. The industry is very close-minded. When, with this stuff, and I know again, I went off on a tangent, I'm so sorry, and I know there's a line. Okay, I'll shut up. <laughs> but let's just say this, um, there's a lot of articles online about it. I work with a wonderful acting coach now, Samantha Kwan, my partner. She really has actually opened my eyes to the way to work with first timers, um, and there's a lot of stuff online about that. Uh, one last thing, if you're hanging out around afterwards, I'd love to buy you a drink. <laughs> <laughs> there, um, so this is, my, this is my second time seeing the movie, um, although I'm pretty sure that's not unique for most people here, but sorry, I have this question on my phone just because I tend to stump stammer, so just probably gonna say. I, always, I feel like there's always been this stigma associated with child performances in TV and film, where more often than not the blame for a bad child performance is put on the inexperience of the actor or actress. And so as a director who I feel has crafted some of the best child performances ever put on screen, when it comes to crafting a great child performance, especially compared to directing older and more experienced actors, how much do you feel that is based on the skill of the director, the talent of the actor, the actress, as well as the material the actors and the director are working with? Oh, wow, okay. Um, <laughs> well, okay, so this is my first time working with children of this age. So I learned a lot, and thank God I had Samantha Kwan on my uh, you know, working with me. Uh, she really actually taught me a lot about how to work with children. Um, I, I saw something, and casting is, is always the most important thing. You know, casting, you cast, uh, you know, uh, people who, you know, you may, you look for, for that first physicality and persona, right? But you actually, you have to put them in front of the camera to see if they will, will be able to function in front of the camera. Some people cannot, I cannot. You know, I, I get all stiff and I literally don't understand the concept of pretending. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, 
Brooklyn showed that she was able to get past that the second she walked into our audition room. She was like a natural born thespian, right? So, but then learning how to work with these kids and not just, you know, understanding that they haven't had life experience, so to ask them to improvise is actually a little bit ridiculous, right? So at first I thought I'm gonna ask these kids to improvise. And I did, and you know, Brooklyn's a wonderful improviser, but uh, you have to um, you have to give them a lot to work with or they don't have it. So, and you also have to be very precise, especially when, uh, you know, uh, yeah, when you're working on film, uh, when you can't just burn film all day, you have to be extremely precise. So we would actually, and I know it, I, I, this is kind of weird, but this is, I just want to demonstrate. You, you go, <laughs> you go, okay, I want you kids to walk in the door here and literally go one, two, three, four, five steps. Then you turn and you deliver your line that direction. And you like you literally have to go that inch by inch, step by step, in order for them to do it. Then hopefully they get looser and looser every time. And and so there was a yeah, it was very, very calculated. More than you would think. And there's also a lot of manipulation in post, I have to admit that. There's a lot of like timing changes in post. But the last one thing I was gonna say, and it gets back to film, the, the point about, people make the point of uh, shooting on film actually brings discipline to the set, and that's very true, especially with children, because at one point I remember, the kids were rowdy, like they would be, uh, like all kids are, and I remember at one point I said to them, to all three kids, hey, kids, you hear that sound? That's the film running through the camera, that's my money running through the camera. <laughs> That's money, and they were like, really? Yeah, so let's, let's, let's stay focused. And it worked. So hopefully I answered that question. But again, there's a lot of stuff online with Samantha Kwan. You can find out stuff there. You keep mentioning all the people you work with because film is super collaborative. I'm a filmmaker myself. I'm also a veteran worker of 10 years. So even when I'm not making a film about sex work, my approach to it and everything still involves sex work. Much like how your films, it's not about sex work. Sex over stories. My question is, I've had trouble finding crews who I feel respect my identity, respect the identities of the actors. What are the green flags I can look for with the crew? Not just a director, but like what are green, because you're a white guy from who went to NYU. You shouldn't, you shouldn't be able to do this. It gets hope though. How do I find people like that? What are the green flags? That's um, <laughs> it's true. Look, it's, like, it's, it's, it's like minded, you know, same sensibility. It's about, you know, what I learned a lot with the Florida Project, going into the Florida Project with much bigger crew, I actually didn't do my job right. I didn't talk to every individual, you know, one to one on one until way further in, way far into the shoot. But even which, to get the trust of, like with Tangerine, to just, I'm a worker of 10 years, and I don't know how to get that trust to oh, get well, the insight and to find a crew that everyone can trust and creates a brilliant film like that. Like, what are the... I think it's the sensibility thing. It truly is. And, and, and a crew being sensitive to uh, perhaps if you're working with people who have faced trauma or you know have lived experience that you do not, respect that. And I have a really wonderful crew that is all like-minded. I think politically we're on the same page. Um, and, um, and they know how to behave, <laughs> you know what I mean? They know how to respect people. They know how to, you know, you, you know I don't know how many crews been on where you know you suddenly have uh, your AD or your DP. I was on a crew where they had to make me do stuff that I didn't want to because I was a sex worker and stuff, and it was like realizing that and stuff. Yes, so it's about it's about respect again, yeah. it's, and it's also just about ethically doing the right stuff as well. But um, but uh, so for example, uh, I have uh, you know I've been on crews in the past where my ADs and DPs almost almost caused fights in public because they're screaming at people to get out of their shot, get out of their shot. I'm like, we're guests in their neighborhood, in their community. What are you doing? That I don't need to work, you know. That's why I mentioned the, the Zen nature of, of Alexis Zabe earlier because he gets it and he knows and there's patience involved and there's just, again, respect. Thank you. But thank you for sharing. Thank I appreciate it. Thanks for not murdering all the sex workers. You don't think everyone else does. Uh, I'm addicted to motivated camera movement. I think you got a handle on it. And uh, a scene that got me the first time I saw Florida Project was when Bobby approaches the would-be pederast 
Uh, you don't do anything complicated, and that's uh, beyond important. I think it's immensely effective. So I'm curious, because you know, it was a steady camera or whatever it was you used. So I'm, it doesn't have to be just about that. You can speak on it on your sense if you'd like. But I'm just curious, what is your thought process when you're considering, do you keep the camera on sticks? Do you move? Are you handheld? I, I wish I had a really great answer for you, but it's more about just um, evaluating the moment and seeing what uh, keeps you in the scene. And I have to say that a lot of it comes down to wearing my editor cap, because I am my ed own editor, and I know, and I always want that, I, I want to, I want to show off the actors. I want to show off the performances if I can. If you see a cutty film, I mean a cutty scene in one of my films, it's because the performances are all over the place. Um, but if I'm holding on it, I'm, if, if, if it's a slower, if it's, you know, if I can get one takes out of people, one takes out of uh, my cast, I will do that. So uh, often there's that thinking about how this is going to cut in post. So when there is a camera move or something like that, it's, it's a pretty deliberate camera move that I know I do not want to cut into. Uh, I hope that I hope that answers that question. Well, great. Thanks, man. Thank you. Uh, this uh, movie has so many great images of just like Americana and camp and stuff that you see a lot on the like, highways and stuff. So I just want to know how did you get the idea to like set it in this place, and also just how what was location scouting like finding all of the different places. Thank you for asking that. Um, my co-screenwriter Chris Bragash was the one who brought this project to me. Uh, Chris sent me an article that was written about the, um, the hidden homeless living in motels outside of Magic Kingdom. This was covered by the press because, you know, even though the hidden homeless situation is nationwide, there's obviously the, the unfortunate irony, you know, of having children living in motels right outside of a place that we consider the happiest place on earth for children. It's, it's something that I think the press picked up on as well, and, they, and we read a bunch of articles about this. Uh, Chris's mother also happens to live in Kissimmee. Kissimmee is right next to Orlando, by the way, and that's where our film takes place. And we, uh, so he was able to take trips there a lot, and he was actually doing a lot of the initial location scouting for us. He would just send me photos on my phone, just like, here, look at this, look at this. And um, a lot of the stuff that he initially scouted was wiped out by the time we shot. And now, since we've shot, a lot of it has changed as well. But um, I think he, he, he was the one who really did that at first. And, and we, do, we do cheat geography a little bit. If anybody is from that area, you'll see there's a little bit of a cheat. Um, that's because the world was changing around us while we were there. And we still wanted to represent what it would look like around, you know, just around 2014, 2015. Uh, hi, my, my question is about uh, poverty, and I really appreciate the way that you represent poverty in your films. I feel like a lot of times it can be either romanticized or kind of simplified in an inconsiderate way. And I appreciate the realism that comes through with both this and Tangerine. And my question is kind of twofold. One is if it has to do with your motivation in that, insofar as do you have personal experiences that you find motivating, or sort of uh, theoretical or critical experiences or thoughts? And the second part of the question would be how to maintain the realism in uh, an economic environment that wants to distort it, to kind of switch the narrative into something that would make it more marketable or et cetera. All right, thank you for that question. Um, you know, to tell you the truth, I think it really just comes down to the scene inequality and really trying to battle against it and fight against it and remove stigma. You know, that's really um, why I think I went into these films. Um, and that's why, you know, for, for the last four films, I guess you could say, since, since, I don't know if you've seen Takeout, but Takeout is much more of a plight of me, right? And we thought it was a little bit too on the nose. It was actually, Distance, even though some people really love the film, I think it's, it also keeps the character and his plight, um, that of an, an, an undocumented immigrant in the US, distant from the audience. Because how many of you have had to deal with a smuggling debt, you know? But after that, after that film, we evaluated that film and we said, next film, let's go with a more universal story that will, will hopefully um, 
lead to the audience, you know, uh, actually connecting to the to the characters um, and putting themselves in their, you know, walking in their shoes, you know, basic empathy, right? And and with the hope that 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 really allows audiences to 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 uh, to, to be motivated to learn more, to hopefully, you know, act up, etc. So, um, and how do I battle against it? Well, I make indie films. I make indie films so I don't have to really answer to anybody, and now I'm in a nice position where I'm able to, if I'm below a certain budget, to retain final cut and basically have total creative control. So that's how I do that. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think we have time for two more questions. Hi. Oh, um, I lived in Orlando and Kissimmee and Winter Garden, and did, was that filmed on uh, iDrive? Some, I think some of it was shot on our drive, yes. Is that where the Magic Castle was? Magic Castle is along Route 192. Oh, okay. Yeah. And then was the cows in Wintergarden? No, no, they were literally, that's the really incredible thing about Route 192, is that it's really farmland. Really? As soon as you go a step behind most of the strip malls and motels, that you'll see a pasture, or you'll see an orange field, <laughs> you know, uh, so. Yeah, and I, I, I just had another question. Um, I actually worked for Disney, um, and I really appreciate, this is why I wanted to come see this film, because I knew that, I knew so many people that were living out of hotels off of iDrive mostly, um, and I really appreciate that you kind of put that in perspective for, here's this great place and everybody working in it, and pay their rent. But um, how did you convince the mouse to let you in and film that? <laughs> And that's... You just did it? They that's why it cuts you. to the iPhone in the last... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they haven't come up all in And I hear a lot of the Disney execs really love it. Oh. That's what I hear.